What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and today we'll be analyzing Game 2 of the 1997 match between Yuri Kasparov and Deep Blue. In Game 1 we looked at things from Kasparov's perspective, and we'll do the same here. Kasparov decisively won the first game as Deep Blue played some questionable moves and couldn't care less about the safety of its king. All was well for Kasparov. However, here in Game 2, things took a controversial turn and I'm excited to cover it. So as you guys can see, Kasparov just played knight e7, and really to this position, both sides have followed the main line in the Morphe defense in the Roy Lopez opening. Following knight e7 from Kasparov, here deep blue continued to follow the main line with bishop e3, and we now see knight g6. Pretty interesting position here with both the g3 and f3 knights facing off against the g6 and f6 knights. We now see queen d2 from deep blue and now knight h7. Why would Kasparov play a move like knight h7? Well here Kasparov realizes that his pieces are pretty cramped. And when your pieces are cramped in chess, a general rule of thumb is that you want to trade off the pieces so that you have more room to operate and attack the weaknesses in the opponent's position. So here with playing knight h7, Kasparov is planning on playing knight h4, as it is now protected by the queen on d8, looking to trade off with that knight on f3. We now see a4, very nice move from deep blue, just expanding on the queen's side and putting some pressure on the b5 pawn. We now see knight h4, both knights come off the board, and now queen e2. Deep Blue playing some really good chess here, just slowly improving the position of its pieces. The queen on e2 is slightly better than the queen on d2, as it's more active, eyeing the b5 pawn and eyeing the g4 and h5 squares. Really like queen e2 from Deep Blue here. Following queen e2, we see queen d8, and now b4. Deep Blue continuing to mount the pressure on the c5 and b5 pawns. And Kasparov responds with queen c7. And now following rook ec1, Kasparov played c4. I actually think that c4 was a mistake. I believe that better was bishop e7, or a move like bishop e7. Kasparov was probably concerned about the idea of a takes b5. And after a takes b5, now b takes c5. Because we see with d takes c5, now white has a pass pawn on d5, but I don't think black really needs to be too worried here. Both the bishop and the queen protect d6, and on top of that, let's just say white plays a move like rook d1, now black could play rook eb8 and prepare a b4 push, creating its own pass pawn, and I would say that this position is roughly equal. But needless to say, instead of playing a move like bishop e7, here Kasparov played c4. My main issue with c4 is that now white has all the time in the world to prepare a queen side attack. As you guys can see, b takes a4 really won't ever be an option for black because it weakens both the c4 and a6 pawns. So really, white has all the time in the world to decide when it wants to take on b5. And here we see Deep Blue play very patient, slow, positional chess with rook a3, and after rook e, c8, rook c, a1. A very nice maneuver here from Deep Blue, playing rook a3, followed by rook a1. And now we have a battery ram coming down on the a-file. But following queen d8, here Deep Blue isn't done. Deep Blue doesn't take on b5, but plays f4. Now Kasparov could have took on f4, but after bishop takes f4, I really don't like black's position here. I think Kasparov was wise to avoid this, as now the bishop is really pouncing down on that d6 pawn. So following f4, we see knight f6 from Kasparov, and after f takes e5, we see d takes e5, and again, deep blue is not in a rush to take on b5 as it realizes that black really doesn't have much it can do. So here deep blue plays queen f1, slowly improving the position of the queen.
Kasparov had a nice maneuver here with knight e8, followed by knight d6. But as you guys can see, here white has created a really strong attack with the bishop and queen on f2 and e3. And now we see bishop b6. I mean, look at the activity of this bishop kicking the queen to e8. And now deep blue continues with rook 3 a2 just moving the rook back. Again, there's really not much Kasparov can do here. And as you guys can see right now, Kasparov simply plays bishop e7, followed by bishop f8. You know if Kasparov is moving back and forth, there's literally nothing he can do. We now see knight f5, followed by bishop takes f5, and e takes f5. Now white would love to play a move like f6. So Kasparov himself plays f6, desperately trying to lock the position up. But now we see bishop takes d6, followed by bishop takes d6. And finally, deep blue decides to take on b5. But now after a takes b5, deep blue plays the brilliant bishop e4, really locking the position up. All the power belongs to white now. This bishop on d6 really isn't doing much, and this bishop on e4 is really limiting the activity of the whole black camp here. We now see rook takes a2, and queen takes a2. Notice how Kasparov can't play rook a8, because obviously the queen could just take the rook with the support of the rook on a1. So we now see Kasparov continue to move back and forth with queen d7, and after queen a7, we see rook c7, queen b6. Now white is slowly creeping in, slowly making its way into black's territory. We now have rook b7, rook a8 check, nice move, attacking the king on g8. And following king f7, we see queen a6, and after queen c7, queen c6, deep blue really just moving back and forth, slowly improving the position of its pieces. And now with queen c6, is threatening mate in one with queen e8 checkmate. So now Kasparov plays queen b6 check, and after king f1, plays rook b8 to stop the checkmating threat. But now, after rook a6, Kasparov resigned the game, and we were sitting at one game apiece. This position may seem pretty hopeless for black, but it turns out that Kasparov didn't actually have to resign. He could have played queen e3. Now up to this point in the game, deep blue played absolutely brilliant with patience, preserving the protection of its king unlike the first game, and really playing Anatoly Karpov like chess. But the one mistake it did make was putting the king on f1, and Kasparov could have took advantage of this with queen e3. Let's just say white plays a move like queen d7 check, followed by snatching the bishop off the board. And now we see with rook f8, Kasparov is threatening both the bishop on e4 and also a perpetual check. Sure, deep blue could play a move like rook to a1, stopping the perpetual check. But after queen takes e4, I actually have black with a better game. So really here, bishop f3 is really one of the only moves for white to hold on here. But now we see queen c1 check, king f2, queen d2 check, king g3. As you guys can see, it's just really hard for white to get out of this perpetual check. Really the only way for white to get out of it is to play king g1. And after queen c1 check, now king h2. But with queen f4 check, and g3. This is the only way for white to get out of it. But after queen takes f3, I have Kasparov with a better position, attacking both the f5 and c3 pawns, as well as having a very active and strong pass pawn e5, not far from promotion. So here, after a move like rook a2 and queen takes e3, I would definitely give the advantage to black. So needless to say, after rook a6, Kasparov could have played queen a3, but he resigned the game. So guys, I hope y'all enjoyed this game. Deep Blue obviously had a much better second game, and this led to some controversy. 
The computer was inconsistent. It didn't care about kink safety in game one, but then plays brilliantly in game two, and then blunders with king f1, allowing queen e3, which Kasparov did miss. However, IBM even put guards around the computer, wouldn't allow Kasparov, or anyone in the public for that matter, to take a look, and its dramatic change in play led to some controversy. IBM even tried to quiet the controversy in the media outlets so that the public would think it was a square, safe match. Kasparov became more and more anxious and frustrated, and one can hardly blame him. Games 3, 4, and 5 all ended in draws, and we will review Game 6 tomorrow. If you enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so y'all don't miss out on that. And as always, I'm wishing you guys a great day. Peace. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to watch another one, you can click or tap up here. And I've got a lot more high quality chess content on the way. So if you'd like to subscribe, you can click or tap down here. I really appreciate your support.